Europe remains afflicted by war. And while discussions of a possible cessation of hostilities are periodically reported on by Russia and Ukraine, the events on the continent's eastern flank are merely one move on the global chessboard ridden with strategic competition by great powers and regional actors alike. Good evening, I'm Jonathan Hassan and thank you for joining us for yet another episode of TV7 Europa Stands. Joining me for today's panel is General Klaus Naumann, who is the former German Chief of General Staff of uh, the Armed Forces, or Bundeswehr, as well as the Chairman of NATO's Military Committee. Thank you for joining us, General. Thank you. Also joining us is Dr. Rafael Bardaji, Spain's former National Security Advisor and currently the CEO of Worldwide Strategy. Thank you. Colonel Richard Camp, a former British infantry commander and head of the International Counterterrorism Intelligence Team at the British Cabinet Office, and General Gustav Hüglund, who is Finland's former Chief of Defense, commander of the Finnish Defense Forces, and chairman of the European Union Military Committee. Thank you for joining us as well, General. Thank you. General Nauman, we would like to start with you today. Uh, as usual, on the 24th of last month, you said in, in an article or in an interview you gave to the Handelsblatt, uh, and I would like to quote it specifically, Putin's illegal and by no means justified war of aggression, you said, against Ukraine, annihilated the European peace order established after the end of the Cold War, which was based on the Helsinki Final Act and on the 1990 Paris Charta agreed upon by the OSCE member states. And then you went on to stress that there is little to no hope for returning to that order. That is a bleak reality indeed. Do you uh, stand behind those words that we will not see the same Europe that existed before the war uh, escalated in Ukraine? I think uh, that is a correct statement. Even a couple of days later, uh, we are confronted with the ruins of the European peace order. We will not be able to restore it. I will go even one step further. We will see global change and we do not know yet where to go for. Dr. Bardaki? No, I think uh, we are coming back to an old principle which is basically the opposite of what Europe has been forging and working for in the last 70 years. is everyone for himself. Uh, the Ukrainians are fighting alone basically, and, uh, and the countries are taking base, mm, essentially national-based uh, positions. So I think uh, the collectivity of our security is in danger, and uh, even if we are presenting a, an alliance united against or condemning Putin, on the ground the reality is that everyone is taking care of himself as much as he can. No? Colonel Kemp? No, I, I agree with that entirely. I think uh, history is going to judge Europe and NATO very, very badly for standing by and watching what's been going on in Ukraine. Now, I recognize that NATO <coughs> and other countries have imposed pretty severe financial sanctions, etc., on Russia and other restrictions. And I also recognize they've provided the Ukrainians with weapons, with uh, some training and also intelligence, all very vital things to keep them fighting. But the reality is they've simply stood by and let and watched Ukraine get mauled by Russia when they could have done something different and I think that's something that uh, as I say history will judge us badly for that. General Hegland? Mm, I think it's very difficult at this time to, to, uh, to try to predict the future. Uh, certainly there will, there will be a big change uh, in, in, the, in international order but very much be, uh, uh, actually uh, depends on the uh, outcome of the Ukrainian war. Uh, it, it, uh, it could be that uh, Ukraine bec becomes a Afghanistan in potence too. Uh, the Afghani, Afghans have defeated two superpowers, the Soviet Union and, and the US, and that, that's, a, that's a possibility. And if, if that occurs, then uh, Russia, Russia will be a, a, a uh, 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 state almost expelled from the from the international community, uh, has to go closer to, to China and so on. Uh, 
the other possibility is, of course, that they will somehow succeed there, and that will uh, form a, a different future again for, 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 for Europe and, and NATO. But one result, certainly, from this attack is that uh, uh, NATO and the European countries have uh, understood that war is still possible and, and uh, started uh, providing more, more troops and arms than, than, than before. Well, I, I'd like actually to quote your late father, uh, General uh, Waldemar Haglund, who was the commander of uh, uh, the 12th Army, if I'm not mistaken, on the Karelian Front uh, during World War II. And uh, when he asked, uh, and uh, uh, with specifically with regard to Finnish resilience in the war against the Russians, whether the Kola will hold, and uh, Kola obviously being one part of uh, that front. Uh, and I'd like to ask you, General Nauman, will Ukraine hold? I think Ukraine will resist for a long time to come. And the Russians are suffering terrible losses. They miscalculated, obviously, the capability of the Ukrainian armed forces and the will to resist of the Ukrainian people. Whether Putin was wrongly informed or not, I simply do not know. But uh, he did not achieve a single of his, any one of his objectives. He succeeded in producing results which he had never hoped for. He formed the Ukrainian identity which didn't exist before. He forged the Europeans to a unity which didn't exist for a couple of years. And miracle, NATO suddenly stands united and the Americans are once again the leader of the free world. These are things which no one had expected. And for that reason, I think whatever the history will judge, this thing was a failure and it will lead Russia not to a greater Russia, but to the decline of Russian power. Indeed. Well, according to uh, confirmed intelligence sources, uh, at least a quarter of the FSB uh, were removed from uh, leadership positions, uh, something that indicates frustration in Moscow, mm -hmm. Dr. Badaki. No, obviously, I think it's a big consensus nowadays that the campaign, as predicted by Putin, has failed. Having said that, in Ukraine today there are several campaigns at once. In the south, I think the, 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 the Russian army has been much more effective in cutting all the access to the Black Sea to Ukraine. In the north, they stopped moving troops uh, several days ago, almost a week ago or more, just to reorganize the, the combat units. I think what they didn't expect was the kind of asymmetric response by the Ukrainian army. Instead of confronting the, the assault brigades and tanks, they were against the logistical supplies uh, lines, against the, the oil and the gasoline needed for the tanks to move. Uh, so they were paralyzed, basically. Mm, but the Russian still has many options. If we are moving from uh, blitzkriegs, concept to an attrition warfare style, I think the Ukrainian has nothing to do against the, the Russian. I mean, it's, it's a little, I mean, a little David against a Goliath, but uh, I think the Russian has still too much power to invest in Ukraine if they want. That is a, such an unbalanced combat that the Ukrainians' fate will be decided by what Putin really wants to do. No? Colonel? I think <clears throat> I think Putin very clearly hoped for a light, the lightning destruction of Ukraine. In other words, on invasion, by demonstrating his capability by physically entering the country and by firing ballistic missiles as, as a demonstration of force. He then thought, I, I think, that, that that would lead to a r fairly rapid collapse of the Ukrainian government. Clearly, didn't happen. Um, I think he's, um, you know, he's very obviously the, the Russian forces have not performed in the way that most people, I think, outside Russia would have expected them to do. I think it surprised most of us. Um, but nevertheless, they have fought very hard. Uh, and I think we should take their combat losses as claimed, for example, by Ukraine and even by our own national intelligence services with a pinch of salt. I don't think anyone really knows how many 
losses the Russians have sustained, and equally how many losses the Ukrainians have sustained. That's kept being kept very quiet for obvious reasons. But I, I think it's been, it's been a, you know, the Russians have taken a lot of casualties. I would say the Ukrainians probably taken a great deal more and suffered a great, much greater mauling from Russia than they have given the Russian forces. So I think that the likely outcome is that Ukraine will not, will not stand, that it will, um, it will eventually be compelled to accept some kind of terms by Vladimir Putin, um, you know, whether, it, whether this is uh, neutrality, renouncement of any possibility of joining NATO, confirming the, uh, recognizing the, uh, the, the, uh, the Russian nature of the Crimea and areas of the Donbass. Uh, accepting a land corridor. I think those things will, they'll be painful for Ukraine, but I suspect Ukraine eventually will have to come to those terms, which means, of course, that Vladimir Putin will have won. Indeed. General Hegland? Uh, when you refer to the Finnish winter war here, my father, uh, and so on, there are actually a lot of similarities between the, the, the Russian attack in 1939 against Finland and the attack now against Ukraine. Uh, uh, and um, I think that Putin follows a little bit uh, Stalin, because Stalin is his, uh, he admires Stalin and, and uh, he's the kind of a ideal for him. Uh, he, Stalin enlarged the empire, whereas Lenin did not and so on. So, so he, uh, uh, the, the Russians, uh, when they attacked, when Stalin attacked Finland, he thought that it he would be received by the Finnish labor uh, like, a, like a liberator. And the, the um, military band was marching behind the front division in, for the, for the uh, uh, victory parade in Helsinki. Uh, and and um, he was completely uh, surprised by the hard resistance and that, that uh, all these uh, that he thought would be uh, like to become communist, where we're fighting for the, for the country. And I think there's it's a lot of similarities in the Ukrainian case that as well Putin thought that they would apply the, the, uh, there's a one, about 30 percent are Russian speakers, but they are not Russians in their nationality anymore. They are, they are Ukrainians. And that must, must have been quite a, 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 a surprise for him. Uh, I don't know whether he's uh, going to follow uh, Stalin's uh, uh, example as well. Stalin was uh, very clever that he he said that I can finish if 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 needed. When Churchill asked him about that, I can I can do it. And and now if if Putin would do it as well then, of course, there would be a completely different uh, solution to the situation there. The, the, the other uh, possible uh, similarity with Stalin was that Stalin was killed by security services. Mm. So that's, uh, that's uh, the, the similarities are, are, are quite... That's a possible similarity indeed, as uh, many uh, discussed this, but there are also uh, differences. Of course, in one day during the Winter War, there were discussions of about 40,000 rounds uh, being fired by uh, uh, Russian artillery as opposed to just 1,000 from uh, the uh, Finnish uh, side, which uh, obviously is, is not the same equation to the situation today with the assistance being granted to the Ukrainians to contend with the Russians. Uh, nevertheless, Gen General, you wanted to note something? Yeah. As we are just about to talk about history, um, I think we should also not forget that uh, the Russian capability to occupy Ukraine as, as country is presumably limited, if it exists at all. Ukraine is, after all, the second largest country in Europe. And if we remember what happened in 1945, there was resistance in Western Ukraine for, I think, almost 10 years against Soviet occupation. The same happened, by the way, in the Baltic countries, where they fought until 54 or 57 in a very stubborn war of resistance 
uh, whether the Russians have the capability to keep this entire country under control, being confronted with the possibility of a guerrilla war, I have my, I have my doubts. Indeed. Well, Dr. Bardakia, uh, on March 10th, you wrote uh, an opinion piece in which you noted that contrary to uh, public media claims at the time, uh, and I quote, the truth is that the Russian troops, despite the photos of the convoys uh, stopped outside Kiev, advance and progress towards uh, their objectives, the seizure of the capital and the capitulation of Zelensky, or whichever comes first, and they are doing so <coughs> with a certain element of containment. They are not raising everything as in Grozny, but they are not leaving civilians alone. Has this reality changed since? I don't think so much. I think there's still the Russian troops, despite what we see from the narrative uh, and the TVs and other media, are still very constrained. They have not chosen the Grozny option yet. They could, but they haven't. Uh, the ca civilian casualties are still limited, given the, the level of attacks. Uh, but it's an option which is open always. No, uh, I don't have any any doubt that the Putin will resort to all kind of destruction if needed to achieve their goal. But it, it's not there yet. Uh, but what is more surprising, actually, is not what we see on TV or from satellites or from intelligence on the ground. It's what we don't know yet. We are still a month and a half after the aggression. We don't know what goals of Putin's are. We don't know if Zelensky government should go or he want to take the occupation of the full Ukraine, or he w will restrain to just get the Crimea and the Donbas incorporated into Russia. We are still struggling to understand what the goals of the special military operation is. No? And, uh, and uh, without understanding our enemy, it's very difficult, really, to, to, to fight in, in an appropriate way. You know? Colonel Kemp? Yeah, I think it's... Um, <clears throat> Uh, I, I, on that on that point, I think that uh, Putin's war aims may have perhaps changed. He he was going for a maximalist case, I think, at the, in the beginning, where he expected the Zelensky government to collapse. He would install a puppet regime. Russian tr Russian troops, certainly in some parts, but certainly in in uh, eastern Ukraine, would be welcomed, um, and you know he would be able to control the whole country one way. I think that's that's been severely revised and his objectives now I would guess and as, as Raphael says nobody knows what his war aims are but I would say his new war aims are to uh, to end this conflict with possession of, um, uh, of of the areas of the Donbass of Crimea of the land corridor possibly in due course of Odessa we don't know whether he will in fact go and deal with Odessa and, uh, and, and perhaps end it like that. I think that's a, a distinct possibility, leaving the rest of the country you know, to its uh, own devices, and then maybe have another bite in a few years' time. Indeed. <laughs> General Hegland, uh, I'd, I'd like also to add to uh, this point. Uh, just at the preliminary stages of the Russian offensive, we heard also the Russian foreign ministry threaten both Finland and Sweden in particular about potentially making the case of joining NATO and the North Atlantic Alliance, uh, saying that it will obviously bring about devastating consequences and much more. Is this a threat you take seriously or uh, is this something that you look as hollow rhetoric? There's nothing new actually in, in that. Uh, Putin stated already on a state visit uh, uh, 16 that uh, it's up to Finland to become a member but of course Russian will then take a lot of military and other uh, con counter actions to that so so we have been aware of this that it would be a Russian negative reaction to, to, to finish uh, NATO me membership uh, this was only a repetition of something that we had heard heard, heard, heard before uh, now they mentioned Sweden as well that that uh, that I haven't heard before but uh, so that was maybe maybe they were uh, more afraid that that it both countries would now 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 join NATO mm -hmm. Uh, actually, uh, you, you were referring earlier a li 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 little bit to, to, to my um, 
opinion of, of, of NATO membership, and I was until until 20 years ago I was for Finland entering NATO. But then, as a, as a chairman of the EU military committee, I visited all the candidate countries, the candidate both to NATO and to 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 to, to uh, uh, EU, and the same song in all of these countries. General conscription down, uh, defense outlays down, uh, uh, and uh, the philosophy being that when, 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 when we uh, support with our crisis uh, uh, management forces uh, U.S. operations in, in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq and so on, then they will be so grateful that they will defend us. And, and, and we don't need to have anything else except for these uh, crisis management uh, um, forces. And I was afraid that that would somehow uh, happen to Finland as well. Uh, although there, there's a co quite a difference with all the other, these, all these other part combatants in uh, continental Europe during World War II were occupied, except Finland. Finland was the only ex ex exception. Uh, uh, UK, of course, but it, they were not on the, on the, in the continent. So, uh, uh, so, so uh, maybe even this estimate, uh, maybe maybe we, we would still have kept the, the defense. But anyway, now we we did it when we did not join NATO. Uh, so, as I show some statistic here, the the will to defend the country is highest in of all. European countries in 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 in, in Finland, uh, uh, but uh, and the other reason then was that actually the option to join NATO, the possibility to make to to make NATO membership, has been quite a a a, a protection for us concerning pressure from Russia because they knew that if they start pressing us, then we will join NATO. Mm -hmm. uh, so it 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 has been a, a very Good situation for to us. To find the balance between yeah. the two sides. But now everything changed. For first, these all these countries that, that disarmed are arming again, especially German, uh, Ger uh, Germany, and and um, and then uh, the the uh, the uh, argument of of the possibility to join NATO and so on is not relevant when 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 when. when uh, uh, as, as a, as a, as a uh, break to, to, to Russian uh, invasion when, 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 when they are anyway occupied in, in, in Ukraine. So I have, I have changed my, my mind for actually now and, and uh, uh, because of the war, war, war in, in, in Ukraine. Even though, uh, General Nauman, we're speaking about uh, arms race and trying to uh, replenish uh, European capacity to contend with such realities. Uh, you started your command on, on uh, at the time of a brigade, if I'm not mistaken, of how many tanks, which turned into... When I commanded the first German Corps, which was at the time the most powerful army corps of NATO in, in its entirety. I had approximately two uh, two thousand Leopard two tanks under my command, and the entire German army had more than four thousand five hundred uh, tanks, uh, eight thousand mechanized infantry, fighting vehicles, and all this stuff. It's all gone, and we made a terrible mistake, Gustav. You're absolutely right. We were among those who believed we can do it with a little bit of uh, peace support operations and crisis management. That was a tragic mistake. Uh, we have learned our lesson. And as we often do in German history, we always fall from one extreme to the other. Now we are back to the 100 billion uh, rearmament program plus 2% per year in real terms uh, for our defense budget. Within a couple of years, we will rebuild. And we always we were always better in our history in rebuilding uh, and sustaining than, than the other way around. Um, so we will do it, and uh, let's say within ten years, uh, the German defense budget, if this line continues, and under Putin's 
criminal act. It will continue. Um, this will be the biggest defense budget in Europe. And whether this is a result Putin had wanted to see, I don't know. I bet not. No, at least uh, having a defense budget of about 35% larger than the Russian defense budget says something indeed. Uh, nonetheless, when we really look at the global stage, uh, the, the Russian maneuver into Ukraine ha was initially also intended to showcase its capabilities to the Chinese, something that obviously the Chinese are now looking at and are asking multiple questions whether this was the right uh, way to go ahead. We saw just last month, uh, the latter days of last month, uh, the uh, Chinese and the Russians meet together, the foreign ministers for that matter, uh, and while Wang Yi uh, provided, at least uh, by his office, a statement saying that there is an increased urgency of collaborating and deepening cooperation between China and Russia, uh, we saw the, the uh, Russian uh, foreign ministry speak more specifically on uh, condemnation of the West and the sanctions regime on uh, Russia for its offensive in Ukraine. How do you see this currently? Is there a certain um, shift within the polarity of the world? Are we seeing a new world order being forged right in front of our eyes? Well, um, I think we are seeing a new world order, but that's nothing new. That was not related to Ukraine. President Xi announced this objective of uh, establishing a new world order by the year 2050, I think three or four years ago. And his claim is that the Chinese model should be the role model for the world. Mm. Um, Putin uh, agreed to support this idea of Xi Jinping, but he is now, I think, in a, in a strange situation. He is not the, in the driving seat any longer of this bipolar alliance. He is weakened. He will get even weaker as a consequence of this war, economically particularly, since Russia has nothing to sell but raw material and weapons. And the entire Western world will try to reduce dependency on Russian raw material. So I think by the end of the day, she will be the one who will lead the Russian poodle to make him jump on his lap. Uh, whether this is the idea Putin had when he started this, I have my doubts. It seems indeed that the dragon is taming the bear, <coughs> uh, Dr. Baudaki. Uh, well, yeah, definitely. I think China is the emerging power in the world. No? And we are facing a new order based on the, on the increasing dominance in all sectors and all policies by, by Beijing. No? But uh, again, we are, we are facing an aesthetic change. Uh, we have now facing in the short term a military crisis in Europe, but we need to put in the right per perspective. Uh, General Nauman said that the, the Germans are better rebuilding than, the, than other things, and uh, I, would, I would act without any cynical uh, perspective, but I think it will be much, much better instead of rebuilding the, the Bundeswehr, just to rebuild the, the, the nuclear power plants in Germany in order to deal with future crises. Uh, if it's an strategic tectonic shift that we are experiencing, we need to put the energy, immigration, population, and military all together on the table. And this crisis could have been done and approached very differently if the Europeans could have not have the dependence on the Russian gas that we have today because of decisions taken 10 years ago or 15 years ago of dismantling the nuclear plants we in Germany. We see the protests, of course, in Spain. Uh, we see the protests in France uh, regarding specifically the, the matter of energy. Yep. Uh, rising concerns, uh, do you see this resolved in the near future considering the fact that Spain is also dealing now with uh, an issue vis-a-vis -vis Morocco and, and uh, Algeria? Algeria. Well, I think energy is going to be a uh, the determining factor in the near future, and uh, people have to rethink the clean, green approach to energy. I mean, uh, in Spain, we, uh, in most of European, we followed all the sample of the country uh, uh, switching off the, the nuclear plant plants. Uh, now they have to go back to carbon, which is more, uh, you know, uh, contaminant than the nuclear power plant. So I think we need to rethink our energy independence in the future, uh, because if not, 
doesn't matter what we do with our military, we will still be sold to the one who are selling the gas from the south, from the east. You know? Indeed, uh, Colonel Kemp, we saw, of course, uh, Prime Minister Johnson last month going to Saudi Arabia, to the UAE, uh, communicating about uh, British uh, energy concerns and, and reaching some understandings, uh, of course, on the broader spectrum. But uh, to what degree do you see this as being a viable solution to the current crisis, considering the fact that uh, it is a different methodology in order to reach uh, the UK, to reach uh, continental Europe, and, and uh, it is uh, far more pricey than uh, the capabilities of utilizing Nord Stream 1 or Nord Stream 2 and so on and so forth? Yeah, <clears throat> there's no doubt it's all going to be less efficient than simply sucking up Russian gas. Of course, in Britain, we have, le you know, thankfully, we have less dependence on Russian gas than many other European countries. But we do have some dependence on it. And of course, you know, when, when Russian gas stops flowing or we stop taking it, we have to take it from somewhere else. So we're also in competition with other European countries for whatever remains. So we, we, we will also suffer from this problem. Britain has a, uh, a relatively recently reinvigorated nuclear program, which um, r ridiculously the Chinese were supposed to be part of. And they, they had a major role in this nuclear program, including constructing several of the power stations. That hopefully is now finished, I think, as a result of coronavirus. Um, but that was the plan. But it's, it's, it's a, a plan that needs to happen. It needs to be accelerated. Uh, one of the biggest difficulties our country has is, is that we have, for some reason, taken the lead on being the kind of green messiahs in the world. We want to be, we want to be the country that leads on environmentalism and you know, the, the, the whole green agenda. Um, which is in direct contradiction to the current situation we find ourselves in. And it goes beyond even just um, the, the, you know, the, the national infrastructure. But we've got people writing papers and making plans and forming branches of the Ministry of Defence about green military and having tanks, electric tanks and things like this, which are pure wokeism, nothing to do with military reality, but just a way of virtue signalling and showing that the armed forces a part of this whole green agenda. So I think that, um, you know, I, I would hope that people have actually sat up and understood that woke and uh, virtue signaling are not what the armed forces should be focusing on. Conceptual aspirations as opposed to biological truths, it doesn't stop there. <laughs> but uh, General uh, Hegland, from a Nordic perspective, how does this contend, considering the fact that, of course, we have Norway with vast offshore gas reservoirs and, and beyond that, uh, does this provide alternatives for Finland and Sweden as well? Yeah, of, of, of course, that's, uh, that, that's a possibility. We have a uh, very uh, integrated uh, power system in, in, um, in Scandinavia, Norway, uh, Sweden and, 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 and Finland already. And, and of course, Norway has uh, <laughs> quite a lot of money uh, saved from from um, from from uh, all these uh, oil fields and, and and so on. Uh, the the other question that interests us, of course, is the is the uh, uh, sea way from uh, 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 in, in the Kalot area, which which might. Uh, uh, Cause all kinds of changes as well. There's uh, a lot of oil as well in 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 in, in, in there, um, but um, we are uh, clearly uh, dependent on on, on Russian uh, gas, particularly now. Uh, but uh, there are steps have already been initiated to to uh, uh, get the, the gas from from uh, the American. Uh, uh, deep, deep uh, uh, drilling mm. fields, fields, and and uh, and um, and we have uh, we have not abandoned the, the nuclear energy, so we 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 get a lot of of clean energy from 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 from, from the nuclear plants, uh, and uh, have not so far suffered from 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 any any uh, deficiencies. Indeed. Well, I, I'd like to ask you, General uh, Nauman, when we, we're looking again uh, to this uh, Russia uh, slash China equation, we see that uh, while 
Obviously, there is an attempt to uh, find alternative means uh, to Russian uh, natural gas and, and other uh, minerals from the West. China is uh, moving in and, and sweeping in quite uh, naturally uh, in order to provide an alternative for the Russians. Uh, of course, uh, the Russians cannot pay their debts at this stage. May we see a Russia that would be similar to uh, certain parts of Africa that are quite uh, angry towards the Chinese, uh, if uh, we put it uh, quite frankly? Well, I have my, I have my doubts on that. Uh, Russia will depend on China. I have, there I have little doubt, uh, since uh, the Chinese are the ones who may take advantage of the Russian natural resources. They are building, a, I think, a huge pipeline from Siberia to the south. They are not able at the moment to connect the western gas fields with this Chinese pipeline. For that reason, uh, it is, uh, Putin doesn't have too much, uh, too much trump cards in his hands. If he wants to cut off right now the gas supplies to Europe, then he would cut himself into his leg. And he, has, he has no other option but to sell it to Europe. But um, China is pers uh, pursuing a very intelligent, long-term strategy on securing the raw material supply for China and for this ambitious China 25 uh, industrial program. They are in control of some of the most interesting resources, uh, so-called uh, rare earth uh, program. Uh, they have a lot of minerals and metals which we need for modern technology. The Chinese are cleverly sealing off their own uh, places where they can find this thing and buy it in Africa and elsewhere, creating thus dependencies on China. Uh, so they pursue, I think, an, a very intelligent long-term strategy which consists of these three legs, the bridge and road thing, the Technology 25 and the idea of uh, offering to the world a new, a new role model, a new world order led by China. I think we should, we should open our eyes, we should, I think, try to better understand our American uh, friends and partners, that they see this as a challenge of the next years to come, and that we, the Europeans, are see still the most powerful economic bloc in this world cannot simply stand aside and, and watch it. We have to be part of it and we have to form together with the Americans a long-term strategy as well to cope with tomorrow's challenge, which is called China. Dr. Bardehi? Well, I agree entirely with you, General Nauman. No? Nonetheless, the Chinese has to face also some short-term tactical decisions just a very superficial and frivolous one. If they still keep the policy of zero COVID cases, uh, they will react very wrongly for their economy dealing with the Omicron wave. I mean, we have seen that last week in Shanghai. Shanghai is locked down just because the Omicron is spreading faster than they can contain it. So, um, uh, okay, the long-term vision is there uh, for sure. Uh, they, they, they are the dominant power in, in, in knowing how to move from here to there. But nonetheless, there are, there are different steps which are going to be harder and harder for the Chinese to reach their goal as well. No? It's, it's going to be an a, a old, old society as well. So there are too many contradictions. So let's see, let's see. You know? Well, um, nonetheless, the, the premise of this strategic competition between the United States, uh, Europe, China, uh, and Russia ultimately uh, is on uh, the base of a peaceful nature, a competition on uh, resources and other aspects thereof. But uh, when we're talking about strong power, ultimately the West is far exceeding both Russia and China from multiple angles. Does this not uh, bring a challenge into this picture of this aspiration of doing uh, or taking over uh, the the so-called uh, rules-based order as the, uh, the hegemon of uh, the 21st or 22nd century in, in their aspirations. Is this not something to, to contend with when we're talking about the current realities being played out? 
I think the um, the Chinese, um, and we've seen their ruthlessness in different parts of the world in recent weeks and months. The Chinese are are still uh, they're an authority authoritarian dictatorship. They don't have you know the, the decisions of the president. He doesn't have to account to anybody. He doesn't have to be elected. He can do as he wants, and he will do as he wants. Western democracies, and the same goes for Russia, of course. Western democracies are in a very different position. We've grown, we all of us, I think, with with probably very, maybe Finland is the one exception, but we've grown very uh, comfortable with a life outside any threat, any danger. Um, we, we're, we've, we're in what some people have described as a post-heroic age, in which the very idea of taking up arms and actually preempting or uh, or re realistically defending against people who attack you, I think, has become um, almost an anathema in some in some situations. And th this has been, you know, this has been fueled over decades by our political leaders. And so I think that the, you know we may we, we could easily, um, for example, we could easily outmatch Russia in, in NATO as it stands now. Could easily outmatch Russia. But it won't do because, and the, you know, the, the nuclear weapons excuse is, is the one that's used as why we can't actually get involved. But the reality is, we don't really have the will, we don't really have the determination anymore in our Western societies to, to to resist this sort of aggression, whether it's from Russia or from China. And I think I don't think this Ukraine war is going to restore that will. I think it may have woken a few people up, but I think we've got a lot further to go yet before we can consider that we will be able to compete in hard power, as you put it, uh, with either Russia or China. Nonetheless, we've spoken about this in previous productions uh, with regard to uh, the AUKUS uh, alliance being forged. And we, we see Australia putting its foot down when we're talking about certain islands in its immediate vicinity being uh, engaging with uh, the Chinese on specific uh, understandings, on specific agreements, and, and the Australians are looking to put specific vessels in certain areas and even utilizing strong power, uh, so to speak, in order to deter those islands from falling into those Chinese trap. Yeah, and I, th I, I would salute the Australians, and I think we could, we could learn a lot from them, not just in, in the kind of issues you're talking about, but if you look at their the really serious immigration problem they had in Australia, which they cured and dealt with by re relatively hard military force, in a way. Mm. Um, when, when we, whereas we in Europe, our European countries, allow uh, the, the, the problem just to walk over us. So I think, um, uh, you know, I think Australia is, is probably a few years behind us in, in getting to the stage of decadence almost, I would say, that Europe has got to when it comes to defending ourselves. General Hegland, I, I'd like to ask you, and uh, I'll, I'll refer to you after, with regard to the European <coughs> Union, actually Dr. Badahi wrote uh, a while back, uh, earlier this uh, last month, excuse me, uh, with regard to uh, the, the promises made by Josep Borrell, uh, the high representative of the European Union vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the, the Ukraine situation predicament vis-a-vis -vis the, the uh, Russians uh, promising aircraft and, and other uh, aspects, something he couldn't deliver and he didn't have the mandate to deliver uh, or to speak about uh, for that matter. Uh, do you see the European Union as an actual player within this equation of uh, uh, the international community when it comes to anything else but economics? Mm. Not, not before they, they, they get the, the house in, in, in order. Uh, it would be necessary to, to, to have a majority decision making in, in, in many fields, particularly in the uh, security and defense policy. It, 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 you cannot always wait until every 27 countries have in their parliament discuss the things and so on. Uh, if you, if you, uh, you, you, you should be able to react much, much faster than, 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 than nowadays. A good example was the, the Afghanistan pullout 
where EU didn't have any role because it would have taken uh, a couple of years to, to make a decision to, <laughs> to go, go, go and assist there. So there, 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 is, there is this consensus uh, when, 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 when that's a precondition for, for any action is actually a break that, that makes it it's quite, quite uh, difficult. And, and then, um, uh, of course, uh, any entity that does not have the means to defend itself is not a, uh, a re reliable uh, partner in, 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 in any crisis. crisis and and uh, the EU has taken some steps now, the strategic compass or whatever it's called, but it's it, so far it's only for crisis management outside, not for 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 the defence of the area itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, uh, I have felt for for twenty years already that uh, it would be a good idea to 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 merge EU and, and NATO in 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 Europe. Uh, it, it's a uh, very ir irrational to start building two organizations, military organizations on the, in the same area with the same participants, but make, make uh, EU the, the uh, European pillar of, 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 of NATO has been my idea already for 20 years, but I have not succeeded so far in, in it. I, I think uh, that that would be very, very natural to, 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 to uh, merge them, put them, put them uh, mm -hmm. together. But of course, then it's important that the EU really gets its decision-making process as well. Uh, Among yeah, others, yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah. Uh, you would like to Well, uh, just a little uh, anecdote. No? Uh, uh, when I, I first visited the headquarters of NATO in Brussels in the uh, late 70s, uh, the last century, uh, I was given as a gift a, a, a black pen in which you could read the terms equal military capability per resolve. I think NATO has moved from there to a different uh, calculation. It's uh, deterrence means today capabilities plus resolve. But the reality is uh, it's a multiplication. And in a multiplication, when one of those the, the factors is zero, the equation is zero. And I think we, t we have forgotten that. No? We can get the best planes in the world, Raptors, whatever, but you don't have the resolve to use them. You are not deterring anyone. And that's what's happening. No? As Colonel that's what Richard, pointed Richard out. just com uh, commented on that, no political will. General? I'm, I would not give up on Europe at such an early stage. Uh, I think we have learned from this tragedy in Ukraine uh, that there is at the end of the day, first of all, the necessity to develop the will and the resolve to fight, and if it be until the very last moment, it will come. I'm, I'm sure it will come back. Uh, we will see the strategic compass, uh, whatever the outcome will be. At the same time, NATO will present its new strategic concept. They all will understand that these are hollow shells if there is not the resolve of the nations to fill the paper with the capability to act and in particular with the will to fight. If that is not there, then the best armament is not worth anything. And if you have learned anything in, in, from this Ukraine crisis, and I think some of our people have learned it, then it is a determination of people to fight for their countries. They will never fight for an anonymous thing like NATO or the European Union. It doesn't mean anything to the infantry man on the, on the ground. He will fight for his country, for his family. And that we have to remember once again. And as soon as we understood this, I think we should not forget these bunch of 33 nations in NATO, led by still the most powerful country in this world, has the capability to achieve everything if there's a will to do it. And there I come back to what Richard said at the beginning. Had we, had we been a little bit more intelligent and had we been awake when Putin uh, occupied Crimea 
had we understood what he has in mind, he has, has, he had told us all for years, but we didn't pay attention to it. Had we understood, the situation might be different today. And I think if there's one conclusion, we should never be again as helpless as we are at the moment. To watch the children are suffering, like I have suffered as a child in the bombing nights in Munich, that must not happen again in Europe. And there we have to learn the lesson. Colonel Kemp? Yeah, I think um, General Nauman's absolutely right. And, and the only way to prevent it happening again is to inflict the maximum possible damage on Vladimir Putin and Russia. And um, that's not just while this war is going on and while the world's attention is on Ukraine, it's also after it's over, whatever, whatever the outcome. We have to maintain pressure on Putin. Putin has to be seen, has to, has to, has to uh, feel the pain and be seen to feel the pain. And my recommendation actually would be that either internally or by Ukraine, he's taken out of power. I, I agree with President Biden the other day when he said this man should not continue to be in power. Now, were Ukraine to decapitate Russia, that would be a lawful act of self-defense. He is a supreme commander in chief of the Russian armed forces who is illegally attacking Ukraine. So they, they would rightly, be, if they were able to, and I doubt they would, be able to take him out or alternatively someone in Russia. Those would be good options, I think, if they came, came about. Maybe not uh, the most likely thing to happen. But assuming that doesn't happen, the, the, the maximum damage must be inflicted on him because if it isn't, He's going to continue. He's not going to leave. He's not just going to finish with Ukraine. He's going to, um, you know, he's going to look at the Baltic states. He may even look at here at Finland. He's going to look at other countries. He's going to retaliate if NATO push forward their forces, as they've said they will, onto their eastern boundaries. Dr. Barlecki, yeah. General. Is, uh, Richard is right on the mark. If we don't stop it now, if we don't convey to him the message that he will suffer incredible damage on Russian territory. Then this will go on. Then Ukraine is just a prelude to something to follow. But in addition to this message to get across, it will be maximum damage, however we'll do it. We have to keep open when and where we'll do it. Since uncertainty is the most essential element in the risk calculation of our opponent and we have we have to make him insecure whatever will happen but he must know that it will happen and this needs to be of course coupled with resolve <coughs> definitely in in many fields not simultaneously you know uh, in confronting the uh, supporting the, the resistance in ukraine and up to little things like uh, indicting, indicting Putin in the International Criminal Court. Could you imagine that the same operation could have been conducted by Israel in, the, the, in a country in the borders of Israel? They will be already hung in, in, a, in, in a type of Nuremberg-style uh, uh, case. No? I think uh, the institutional, the international organizations should start moving against the aggression of Putin, the illegal actions, the, 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 as, as President Biden said, the war criminal acts uh, taking place in, in, in Ukraine. No? But uh, the problem is that, as uh, General Nauman said, it caught us in the worst moment of the West, disarmed mentally and, 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 and materially. You know? and, uh, and how can we rebuild in a race against time? Because Putin has much more cards now in their hands than us. So, but it, it has to be done, no? How? Well, that's the million question, no? Oh. Yeah. Uh, General uh, Hegland, obviously Finland uh, has not yet made its decision regarding NATO. Nonetheless, no, 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 no. it is uh, in the process of force buildup. It is uh, procuring uh, systems, whether it's the F-35 or other systems that are interoperable with NATO and with Western all alliances, the time, all the time we have which them. indicates that it doesn't matter whether the title is NATO or not, it has the capacity to receive the backing from the West if the West has the resolve to provide it. Are you able to trust foreign countries to come to Finland's aid uh, if such a situation arises similar to the one in Ukraine? Uh, we have a saying from the uh, 
what is it, uh, 757, I think it's. Marshal Augustine. It's, 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 it says that stay afterwards, stay here on, on your own ground, don't trust foreign help. So uh, we are not building our, our defense on, on, on that, but we are very prepared to take, we are, we are very uh, uh, much using the same standards as, 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 uh, as NATO and, and uh, some people even say that we are, we are closer to the NATO standards than some NATO countries <laughs> in, 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 in fact. So, so that has been very important for us to be able to, to, to receive that, that help, but the, the defense itself is not built on on, on, on somebody coming and, and, and doing some it for, for us. But I think that if we, if we fight as bravely as us in the last uh, World War, we, we are certainly are going to, to, to have uh, friends who, 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 who like to come and, and help us, like Ukraine has, has now. Yes, that's, a, that's a good, good example. Concerning the uh, solution of this Ukrainian crisis, it's, uh, as I have understood it now, uh, in a way Putin as is suggesting a, a divi division so that he keeps the eastern part and, and uh, the rest of Ukraine stays um, uh, uh, independent but, uh, 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 but uh, not military allied or so. I, I, I have a very difficult to to think that the Ukrainians could accept after all these the destruction, all these fighting, all these casualties they have had, that they could accept such a a a a a, 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 a solution. It's it's Indeed. it's it's. Uh, I, I think Zelensky um, has said that we are going to fight to the last person or something, and and uh, so uh, I don't. I don't see this as a possibility out of it. And all the other solutions would, would mean a defeat for Putin. Indeed. Well, this is all the, t uh, the time that we have for today. Uh, you were, of course, speaking about the late Field Marshal Augustine Ehrenswart. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yes, yes. Indeed, who built a very special fortification, which was later also conquered by the Russians uh, out of all. But uh, we will leave that to another uh, program. <laughs> well, uh, you are, like you are very, 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 very aware of Finnish history. That's <laughs> good. Uh, General uh, Nauman, Dr. Bardahi, uh, Colonel Kemp, and uh, General Heglund, thank you so very much for being part of today's panel. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we will see you next time.